and welcome to Autocracy Now. As part of our series on Huey P. Long, this is episode 3, School Books and Blood. In 1928, Huey Long was riding high. He'd beaten all opposition and achieved the second step in his life plan. Get elected to minor public office, check. Get elected to the governorship, check. There's little doubt, given that everything we know about him, that he was already angling for a seat in the Senate, the next on his list. Although, in his early addresses, he was already lying about ridding the state of corruption and waste without ambition for ever again holding another public office. A bold claim for a man who had become president on his to-do list. But in order to do that, he would have to deliver on his outlandish promises that he'd made in the campaign to be governor. He had to keep his base on side and prove that he wasn't the lying demagogue that his hated media constantly portrayed him to be. In the meantime, the powers that be in the state of Louisiana dusted themselves off and began strategizing. How could they manipulate the young and experienced governor to keep their interests on side? They had dealt with demagogues before. Huey was not unique in that respect, although few of them so far had made it to his lofty position. But confidence was probably high amongst the establishment, that most of them thought they could work with Huey, that things would continue more or less as they had before, and in a few years, promises largely broken, the political machines could wrestle back control from this interloper. This was how many people thought it was going to go. A lot of them were mistaken. Huey's first violation of the political norms of the state began almost immediately when he took office. Traditionally, one of the first things a new governor did was call a convention, where delegates to the National Party convention were selected. So, here is a good degree of Louisiana horse trading. Every party member and faction was traditionally doled out its fair share of delegates, and a roughly equal number from all of the political factions would attend and be represented in Washington. But Huey couldn't allow this to happen. His leadership would be undermined if his political opponents were representing the state on the national level. Remember, he has these national ambitions. He can't make it seem like Louisiana is anything other than behind him. But Huey, well, Huey checked the state constitution. It described this democratic process by which you could choose these delegates, but it didn't legally require that you did things that way. In fact, there were few requirements at all. It was perfectly legal under the constitution for a small, centralised committee to choose the delegates. So, Huey formed this committee. Promising everyone on the committee a cushy job and maybe engaging in a few other backroom deals, Huey won round a majority of them. So two votes happened in quick succession. The first dispensed with the Democratic Convention to pick delegates. And the second approved a list of delegates that had been hand-picked by Huey. Naturally, all of his prominent opponents, all the people associated with the old regular political machine, they were all left out. The fix was in, and the Democratic Party of Louisiana would be represented by Huey Long loyalists that year. One of the characteristics of Huey's use, or possibly abuse, of power is how brazen he was in doing it. This is one of the areas where it really depends on how you fall down on the question of Huey's real intentions. If you support him, you'll buy his argument that he has a mandate from the people, that he's sweeping aside corrupt and unfair institutions, that he's getting rid of bloated, ineffective government, and why shouldn't he do this proudly? But if you're against him, you see it as a flagrant and dangerous disregard for tradition, democracy, and the opposition that shows him as a dictator in the making. Stifling debate, forcing through votes, these happen constantly in Huey's career, but is it undemocratic or just anti-opposition? But the thing about Huey Long is that he rarely did any of this behind closed doors, none of it was secret. In the end, regardless of motivation, the result was the same, and the impotent bleating of his undermined opponents made little impression. Quote, They say they were steamrolled, said Huey a week after the coup. I think that's true. The only reason the roller didn't pass over more of them was that there were no more in the way. I had promised my people that I would put this gang of bosses and plunderbun pie-eaters out of control of the Democratic Party just as quickly as I could. We hesitated very little about it. In this incident, Huey used a legal technicality, a loophole in the Constitution, to get his own way. Even though this wasn't the way things traditionally had been done, and it was a considerable seizure of power by the governor, it was still within the letter of the law. But this was not always the case. When Huey interrupted a meeting of state senators... One of them sarcastically threw him a copy of the state constitution. Have you heard of this book? he said. The riposte from Huey, as ever, was swift. I'm the constitution just now. Constitution or no, Huey really needed to take control of the state legislature. Although he'd run as part of a ticket, 
there were only really 18 out of 108 delegates that you could really describe as pro-long at the start. But at the same time, there were only a few vehemently anti-long delegates. The rest were waiting, in time-honoured Louisiana fashion, to see who would value their loyalty the most, who could pay the highest price. He made use of his governor's privilege to appoint men to key positions, alongside his skills at horse trading with the opposition to sway the loyalties of individual delegates. Under the guise of kicking the rascals out, as he put it, he handpicked the Speaker of the House, Jean Fournet, the President of the Senate, Philip Gilbert. Huey had run with a slate of delegates on his side, including some of the state legislatures, and his deputy governor, Dr Paul Sear. Remember Robert Maestry, the sleazy backer who funded Huey's campaign? He was appointed head of the Department of Conservation. Again, technically, things were usually decided by negotiation, horse trading, and they ended up more or less evenly split between the various factions in the Democratic Party. But this time, the leaders of the House and Senate had the authority to name committee members. Traditionally, the legislature got to nominate its own committee members, so these would be the committees that would take care of things like agriculture, fund appropriation, that kind of things. But Huey nominated his childhood friends to these positions. He personally told the House and Senate leaders who to appoint to every committee. Huey had come up through this minor state legislature, and he knew the ins and outs, and he knew the powers that could be brought to bear from seemingly dull, boring offices. Harley Bozeman, a friend from Wynn Parish, was in charge of the House Appropriations Committee. The prolonged delegates on the House floor would be led by O.K. Allen, another close friend and confidant of Huey's. Allen and Bozeman had been with Huey since he was a nobody from Wynn County, and they were tasked with figuring out who in the legislature was on his side, who was dead opposed, who could be swayed, and how. At the centre of the whirlwind, in the hot Louisiana sun, Huey and his inner circle worked tirelessly towards these ends, scoping out every angle of unfair advantage. Thanks, John Doniel. Huey's secretary, Alice Lee, was one of the chosen few who were constantly in contact with Huey. More than a few salacious rumours were sparked after her divorce in 1928. Key to Huey's plan was a constant supply of cushy jobs that he could offer to his supporters. You have to remember that Louisiana was in the depths of poverty even before the Wall Street crash of 1929. So the state government was a huge sector of the economy. The jobs they could offer were vital to many people's livelihoods, to their families. The governor personally controlled some jobs, but Huey made it his mission to take over as many of the state commissions as he possibly could and stuff them with prolonged loyalists. It might seem that having control over the Conservation Commission, the Board of Health, the Highway Commission, it's all fairly administrative, all of which are things that Huey targeted. It might seem that having these commissions wouldn't necessarily give you that much political power compared to having more people in the legislature or more judges on your side. If you didn't know how this system of patronage worked, you might question why Huey spent so much time making sure he had the majority on, say, the board of a hospital, the board of a university, or a school. These things were major political coups for Huey. You might question why, in the early days, he spent time micromanaging these institutions, firing traffic cops and port officials who disagreed with him and replacing them with long loyalists. But Huey realised and recognised that these institutions would give him the supply of patronage jobs that he needed to sway people over to his camp. Everything that could become politicised, everywhere he could command loyalty, he wanted it. There were some jobs that he wouldn't touch, those that needed genuine specialists to operate them were left alone. Huey was no fool, he'd occasionally tolerate dissent amongst people who were too useful to be eliminated. But what he was doing was using the powers of his office to construct a vast, corrupt machine of personally loyal clients. You could argue that he needed control over all these boards to push through his radical agenda without opposition. You could argue that, as governor, he would be held ultimately responsible for what state-owned or state-funded institutions did, and that therefore he had a right to exert some influence over them. Huey would argue that all he was doing was kicking out corrupt and ineffective bureaucrats and officials, and in a sense he was, it's just that he was replacing them with his own. What can't be denied is that he amassed a lot of power this way. By the time he was finished, thousands of people across the state would owe their jobs, and their loyalty, directly to one man. What's more, they all had to pay a portion of their salary to fund Huey's future political campaigns. In Huey, the state had a governor who was willing to use every trick in the book to enhance his own power, and who moved with a swiftness that his opponents could hardly respond to. Bills or lists of candidates for office would be swiftly and mysteriously introduced into the middle of legislative sessions. Just as quickly, 
Often before anyone had any time to read them and digest them, they would go to a majority vote that Huey would win. Huey had other tactics. When a backlog of legislation built up which slowed Huey's bills down, he would order his delegates to vote in favour of everything, just blanket across the board, everything gets a yes vote. And in the space of a couple of hours, the entire backlog had been completely cleared, and the legislator, they staggered out after passing dozens of bills. They didn't quite know what to make of it. Suddenly, the long faction which had opposed them all the time was pliable. Later, Huey would look through all of the bills, because he had the governor's constitutional power to veto any bill, and he vetoed the ones that had been proposed by his opponents. Normally the veto was only used in very extreme circumstances, but Huey just blanket wielded it. Previous governors, they'd usually allow little things that their opponents supported to go through. A lot of them were operating on the same system of patronage as the governor himself. So if you represented a town, maybe you'd promise them a new road. And usually the state legislature was happy to help each delegate pass their own bill, so that they might stand a chance at re-election. If you'd ever opposed Huey, though, he'd make you pay for it. Like a politician who would be famous a few generations down the road, Huey kept an enemies list. Again, there was nothing technically illegal about this swaggering wielding of the veto in the Constitution, but it was a dictatorial use of the legal powers that Huey did have, and it hurt a lot of people. Of course, all of this was part of getting people on side. After all, if you couldn't fulfil your campaign promises without Huey, well, maybe the better the devil you know. Quote, There were men in the legislature that that went over to him that I never thought would go. He must have bought them or got something on them, one shell-shocked opponent reflected years later. If a member of your family worked for the government, Huey was not above using that as leverage. Nice job your son has there would be a shame if something were to happen to it. He took steps to ensure that all of the new appointees to the boards were completely under his thumb. Before they took office, Huey made them write and sign letters of resignation with no date. If the new employee ever disappointed Huey, he'd fill in the date and mail himself a letter. Amongst the people whom Huey gave jobs to were members of his own family. This nepotism is common amongst dictators, so his brother, Earl Long, found himself in a $15,000 a year job as an inheritance tax collector. For reference, that was twice Huey's salary as governor. Huey had promised on the campaign trail that this position would be abolished and the money used to construct a TB hospital, but of course that... TB hospital just turned out to be money for his brother. A couple of dozen of Huey's relatives found themselves in government jobs. Again, Huey was brazen about what he was doing. When people accused him of nepotism and said, you know, you're hiring members of your own family, he bragged that he would have hired more members of his own family if some of them hadn't been in prison. In Huey's own glowing autobiography, he describes the patronage that he's using here as, quote, the spoils of war, end quote. It's quite a thing to run on an anti-corruption platform and then install your own corrupt bureaucracy. In a typical quote, he explains how constructing his machine was necessary for the good of the people. They say they don't like my methods. Well, I don't like them either. I really don't like having to do things the way I do. I'd much rather get up before the legislature and say, now this is a good law and it's for the benefit of the people, and I'd like you to vote for it in the interest of the public welfare. Only I know that laws ain't made that way. You've got to fight fire with fire. This is the polarisation at work. If you decided that Huey was on your side, you would admire his brazenness as evidence that he was sticking it to the man. You'd be willing to defend what he was doing, even when it was morally dubious, because, after all, everyone else was worse, right? So we have to ask ourselves, given that he was consolidating power, what did he actually do with it, aside from enriching himself and his family, of course? One of the bills established a dodgy-sounding Bureau of Criminal Identification. This effectively established an independent police force. They would have sweeping powers to make arrests anywhere in the state of Louisiana without warrants for all violations of the law. Who controlled the appointments to this shadowy police force? The governor, of course. The new law enforcement and the National Guard of Louisiana, which Huey used to his own advantage, well, they became instruments for the settling of political scores. Colonel Ewing, the wealthy newspaper owner, remember him? And Sullivan, who controlled the New Orleans faction. These were the people who'd supposed to be loyal to Huey, and they'd failed him. They delivered very few votes, and Huey felt betrayed. So it will come as little surprise to you to learn that Huey had their gambling houses and brothels raided, without a warrant in the middle of the night. The money his men collected from the gambling parlours was sweet. Revenge was probably sweeter, 
but now Huey had no faction in New Orleans. But in terms of enacting his populist promises, the ones that had really got him elected, the school textbooks, the roads, the hospitals, Huey needed money that the state just didn't have. The solution was classic long. There was to be a severance tax on all the oil taken from Louisiana oil wells. Huey was never going to get the backing of Standard Oil, so he might as well double down on the attacks on them as governor and use them to fund his program. After all, this was exactly in line with what he said he'd do, tax the greedy corporations. But feuding with Standard Oil wasn't the same as bullying some individual state legislature by threatening his pet pork barrel project or, or outwitting or outpoliticking the dumbfounded politicians of New Orleans. They had plenty of men whose jobs depended on them, and they had that team of crack lawyers that Huey had come up against before. Standard Oil were going to fight back. When the severance tax, which would have raised $2 million a year, much of it coming straight from Standard Oil profits, was proposed, a company sued, saying that the tax was unconstitutional. This put Huey in a bind. The new school year was approaching, and while the legal battle over the tax continued, the state didn't have the money to pay for the school books. If he couldn't deliver on his key campaign pledge, his opponents would have all the fuel they needed to denounce him. So Huey negotiated for a loan from a New Orleans bank for half a million dollars to pay for the books. The bank, mistrustful of this brash young demagogue, told Huey that such a loan would be illegal. There was no guarantee that the state would win the case and be able to pay them back. Quick as a flash, Huey came up with a riposte. Did you know that the state owns your bank? Did you know that the state owes your bank $935,000 on these loans just now? If it's illegal to make them, it's illegal to pay them. It will keep the $935,000 and have money to spare after paying for my books. He was threatening to default on a loan of nearly a million dollars, and such was his reputation that no one was quite sure if he'd do it or not. In the end, the bank weren't sure. The bank backed down, the money was loaned, and the school books were delivered on time. Huey described the event. No accomplishment of my career has given me such satisfaction. I imagine that maybe this wasn't entirely true. You've got to remember that the Huey who said that was the Saint Huey from his autobiography. But even if it wasn't really the happiest moment of Huey's life to deliver school books to smiling children, it was a coup, and undeniably a popular success. 600,000 school books had been delivered to the poor children of Louisiana. The big oil companies looked set to pay. It's a Robin Hood story that it's really difficult to disapprove of. One of the school kids wrote to Huey, You're the only governor of Louisiana who has done what you said you'd do. His methods were unscrupulous, but in this instance he did an unquestionably good thing. The motives are what you can and maybe should question. Other governors had promised to deliver natural gas to the city of New Orleans too. In his first year, Huey managed it. The old regulars of New Orleans were no fans of the proposal. They controlled the lucrative monopoly on artificial gas that heated and powered much of the city. But Huey outmaneuvered them, forcing the legislation through the state senate and accusing them of artificially keeping prices high for the people of Louisiana. Once again, the political machines were defeated and forced to concede, and Huey had fulfilled another promise. The next item on the agenda was roads. Louisiana's roads had long been a disgrace for the state. Many areas were still in the mud in 1928, but no former governor had been able or willing to raise taxes in order to pay for new ones. Huey couldn't either, with his oil tax still trying to work its way through the courts, but he managed to raise funds for his infrastructure program by selling state bonds. The state was effectively going into debt to pay for his program. He could only raise a modest $30 million this way, nowhere near enough for a project on the vast scale that he'd envisioned but he hoped that the people would get a taste for good roads, and then there would be popular support for the taxes to fund the rest. But when his vote on the bond bill went through, he was two men short of the two-thirds majority that he needed for such a spending amendment. Huey, having spent the last few weeks negotiating with individual members, well, he lost his patience. The two recalcitrant legislators who failed to show up for the bill were marched to the house by state policemen. Huey's tactics were brutal, bullying, and violated every democratic norm in the book but they got the job done and made him a hero amongst his supporters. Huey had brought the exact same mix of unscrupulous wheeler dealing and frenetic energy to the office of governor as he had brought to every other endeavour he'd tackled in life. When he found the Louisiana governor's mansion to be dilapidated and not to his liking, 
he ordered it to be torn down. His conservative critics were aghast at the sight as he ordered convicts from a local prison to tear down the old house. A new one would be built to Huey's specification. It's difficult to imagine a more symbolic act that he could have undertaken, but his ruthless, dictatorial and uncooperative steamroller methods further alienated many of his fellow politicians and many of the wealthy elites. He even managed to alienate his own lieutenant governor, Paul Sear, who had run on the same ticket as him less than a year ago. It was illegal for a governor to succeed himself if he'd served a full term, so Sear had probably hoped for Huey's endorsement for 1932. But when he discovered that Huey had no intention of endorsing him, their relations soured. And then they both became embroiled in a notorious murder case. A man named James LaBeouf, no relation to Shire as far as I know, took his wife out boating one summer evening. Then the man turned up dead. According to more lurid accounts, he was shot by his wife's lover, a Dr. Dreyer, and his handyman, Jim Beadle. Beadle gave evidence to the state and was sentenced to life imprisonment, but Dreyer and Mrs. LaBeouf, for conspiracy to murder, were sentenced to death. Huey was happy to sign the warrant, calling it a conscienceless murder, but Sear felt differently. Dreyer was a personal friend, and besides, the sentence was very controversial with the state and the media divided over what should happen to the pair. Dreyer was well liked, and the state had never before hanged a white woman. Sear came down on the side of Dreher and Mrs. LaBeouf, and threatened that if Huey left the state, he would commute their sentences as acting governor. Huey quotes him in his autobiography as saying, How long have I been humiliated in having to deal with this man? Which seems like he's smearing Sear, saying that Sear was an elitist. In the end, though, Huey didn't leave the state. Not for the first time, he had to stay in the state to avoid Sears' influence. In the end, Huey got his way, and the pair were hanged. But his break with Dr. Sear was irreparable. In March of 1929, after a year of being in office, Huey had some substantial achievements under his belt. In terms of his campaign promises, the roads were underway and the school books had been delivered. These policies were wildly popular with the electorate that had swept into victory. In terms of politicking, a third of the state's employees were personally loyal to him. But he knew that he needed that standard oil money to keep his projects going, and so in March of 1929 he called a special session of the legislature to try and force through a new tax that would hit the hated Invisible Empire. This oil processing tax would raise $3 million from Standard Oil alone. It's worth remembering at this point Huey has this vendetta with Standard Oil, and it stretches way back to his early legal days. He even invested in oil stocks that Standard had crashed when he was worth only a few thousand dollars. The corporation, too, was an easy target for Huey's populist, anti-corporate rhetoric. And indeed, in a lot of ways, it did exert massive influence over states, and was eventually disbanded as being unconstitutional a few years later. But it was not just the corporation's political machine that was opposed to Huey. Many people worked for Standard Oil, and the company was threatening layoffs if the tax went through. And the legislators who represented the oil-producing regions, well, they knew that voting for the tax would alienate their voters who could lose their jobs. The conservatives and the wealthy, they were deeply opposed to the tax. Previous hikes, had it, they'd increased existing taxes marginally, but this was a completely new tax. Even some of Huey's closest friends and associates were concerned. His old school friend, Harley Bozeman, said that he thought this new tax was maybe a bridge too far. But Huey didn't listen. He was determined to steamroll through this new tax, just as he'd done with everything else, against any opposition. But maybe for the first time in his entire political career, Huey had misjudged the situation. When the initial count took place in the legislature, he realised that he didn't have enough votes. Things got increasingly heated as the session wore on. The Standard Oil men arrived with, in Huey's words, enough money to burn a wet mule, and they began allegedly dispensing bribes to people who might have voted. They threatened to shut down their refinery in Baton Rouge, the state capital. This refinery employed over a quarter of the workers in that city. The newspapers trumpeted this threat and called it a spite tax. Huey dragged out the legislative session for longer and longer. Sear, now his bitter enemy, accused him of feathering his family nest. He threw doubt on Huey's dealings with oil companies, 
and it's true that Huey had leased some oil-rich land to Texas in a deal that always seemed fishy. He denounced Huey as the worst political tyrant to rule the state. Even his own deputy was now on the attack. Huey fought back, but not in a particularly honourable way. A Baton Rouge publisher received a veiled threat from Huey. If you don't lay off me, I'll publish a list of the names of the people who have relatives in the insane asylum. He knew that the publisher's brother was in a state mental hospital. The publisher, though, was not going to be threatened. He published Huey's threat. This is the way your governor fights, he wrote in an editorial. I might say that my brother is the same age as the governor. He was in France in 1918, wearing the uniform of a United States soldier, while Long was campaigning for office. Resorting to such awful tactics as to shame a mentally ill man shows how desperate Huey had become. But astonishingly, he doubled down on his attacks on the publisher and his brother. Quote, They say I should leave him alone because shell shock caused his illness. Have you ever heard of shell shock causing syphilis? End quote. He rounded on the legislators who opposed the tax, implying they were bought and paid for by Standard Oil. But Huey went too far. There were legitimate reasons to oppose the tax on economic grounds, and people had to represent their constituents who worked for Standard Oil. Later, in his autobiography, he would say, rats began to leave the sinking ship. The newspapers began to call for his impeachment. The Standard Oil man who was in town lobbying advised his opponents, if you're going to impeach him, do it right now. If you wait, he's smart enough to think up a way to beat you. The legislators who opposed his tax included one J.Y. Sanders, who you'll remember had to put up with Huey's lurid allegations on the campaign trail last episode. Together, this band of anti-long impeachers even had a catchy nickname. They called themselves the Dynamite Squad. There was no end to the lurid allegations. Sanders and his crew claimed to have a sworn affidavit from Huey's ex-bodyguard. According to this document, Huey had ordered the assassination of Sanders. I mean for you to kill the son of a bitch. Leave him in the dirt where nobody will know when or how he got there. I'm the governor of this state and if you were to be found out, I'd give you a full pardon and many gold dollars. At least that's what the statement said that Huey had said. The historians disagree over whether this is completely made up, whether Huey said it in a drunken rage but didn't mean for it to be taken seriously, or whether it was a genuine threat. I can believe either one of the first two, as in maybe it's made up or maybe it was a drunken comment. Huey liked a drink, but at this point his nerves must have been shot. For the first time since he was a dirt poor salesman walking alongside a railroad track, he was seeing a major reversal in his fortunes. And here again, it depends which Huey you believe in. His dream for a more fair and just America, where people would be lifted from poverty by taxes on the rich and the corporations. Well, this was crumbling in front of his eyes. Or alternatively, his dream, public office, governor, senator, president, was crumbling before his eyes. It's not unbelievable that when he was in his cups, he would have yelled for Sanders' blood. He was one of the ones who was ruining that dream. Things came to a head in one of the more dramatic Monday nights of Louisiana politics history. Huey realised that he could not get the tax passed. He also knew that a legislature that was not in session could not impeach a sitting governor. His man, Speaker Fournay, called for the legislature to adjourn. As he did so, allegations about Huey ordering an assassination were being yelled out on the House floor. Fournay banged his gavel and tried to call the proceedings to order against the angry protestations of the dynamite squad. But it was no use. He could see that the only way out of it was to call a vote on the motion, the motion to adjourn, the motion that would save Huey. The state had recently installed a new electronic voting machine, and all the members pressed their buttons to vote. Exactly 67 green lights lit up in favour of adjourning the legislature and protecting Huey from impeachment. The only problem was that there were not 67 men who had voted to adjourn. The voting machine appeared to have been rigged. Amidst cries of foul play and treachery, I kid you not, Fournay literally threw down his gavel, declared the legislature adjourned, and scurried away. All hell broke loose. Oh God, don't let them get away with this, cried one legislator. 
Protesters surged towards the speaker's chair. Fournay returned, realising they were not dispersing, and was surrounded by a protective wall of prolonged legislators as the protesters advanced towards them. Soon, inevitably, in a way that's probably better missing from modern politics in the West, it came to blows, physical violence on the floor of the house. A fistfight broke out. Books, inkwells and all kinds of other projectiles flew across the room. Enough men were wounded that this day was referred to as Bloody Monday in Louisiana political folklore. Huey himself said in his autobiography that this was an uproar that no pen can adequately describe. Amidst the carnage, an anti-long delegate stood on the desk and bellowed for order. Miraculously, the fighting stopped, and the anti-long man began to manually count the votes. When he'd finished, amidst the violence, it was clear that the anti-long forces were triumphant. There were 79 votes to remain in session, and just 9 to adjourn. They would not go away quietly. They would be coming back tomorrow. And there, they may well decide to impeach Huey. Things were little better the next day. One senator remarked, I'll bet there were 500 pistols in that crowd. Speaker Fournay, having presumably changed his trousers, apologised for last night's irregularities. The voting machine, he explained, was faulty. It had just displayed the results of a previous vote. No one had tried to rig the machine. Why would anyone do that? This seems like a sketchy explanation on the face of it. Okay, so the machine was new, it was operated by a rather arcane and fault-prone system. But then again, in all honesty, I can't really believe that Huey would be stupid enough to try and rig an important vote. Surely he must have known that the people wouldn't fall for it. If the vote was rigged, maybe it was by a supporter who didn't know what they were doing. Not that it mattered. The events of Bloody Monday were a political disaster for Huey. When a long supporter asked again for adjournment, it received only 39 votes, nowhere near enough. Then the dynamite squad, Huey's sworn enemies, took to the floor. With them, they brought an incredible body of charges against Huey. So often you expect impeachment proceedings to involve a carefully built legal case that indicates exactly how the person involved has broken the law. This was more a case of throwing everything at Huey they could possibly think of. The rap sheet included carrying a concealed weapon, violently abusing citizens, fondling a New Orleans stripper, and blasphemy by comparing himself to Jesus. Alongside this there were more serious allegations. Huey had illegally influenced judges, bribed legislatures, pillaged private property using the state militia, attempted to intimidate the media, misused state funds, and hired his bodyguard to kill Sanders. Even the members of the Dynamite Squad would later admit that this last charge, the assassination, was unsubstantiated, and wouldn't hold up in court, but that the bodyguard made a good witness. Long's political enemies, like those in the New Orleans political machine, held a huge rally where the speakers denounced his demagoguery and dictatorship. The press rejoiced. By overthrowing the tyranny of Long, one paper said that Louisiana was returning to greatness. Some of the charges may have been false or frivolous, but there was enough truth in the allegations to bury Huey, and real momentum behind the campaign to do so. Huey's tricks with the legislature weren't working, he couldn't get them to disperse. Huey couldn't sleep. He spent his nights pacing the corridor in his hotel room with a revolver shoved in his back pocket. There was a very real possibility that his political career was over. Thanks for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter at Autocracy Now, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating, review on iTunes or your favourite podcatcher, tell your friends to listen to us. That way I don't have to hire dozens of Twitter bots with fishy names to promote the show. No one wants to see that. Tell your enemies. Next time, we'll watch as Huey Long tries to fight off impeachment charges and consolidate his control over Louisiana. Until then, be kind to each other. Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today is part of our series on Huey P. Long. It's episode 4, The Dynamite Squad and the Round Robin Ears. Last time, we saw Huey take over as governor of Louisiana. 
Now initially, he was able to steamroll a lot of his programme through the stunned legislature and seize an awful lot of political control from the establishment. But, when he tried to impose a new severance tax on the oil companies to pay for his programmes, his opponents came back with a vengeance. They brought charges of impeachment against him, basically throwing the book at everything that Huey had done, and Huey's attempts to shut down the legislature nearly resulted in a riot. In March of 1929, just a year after he'd assumed office, it looked perfectly possible that Huey would be impeached and go down in state, not national, history as a bizarre footnote, a rush of blood to the head before the establishment regained control. In the days after the riot, Huey was seen depressed, downhearted, dispirited. His brother Julius, who he'd had a stormy relationship with since their shared legal practice fell apart, well Julius feared that he might even commit suicide. It certainly seemed that his political career was over, with the media and his opposition lined up against him. But of course this is not what happened. Huey wasn't going to let it happen. And as he so often did when things seemed to be turning against him, he went back to the one group of people who had always loved and supported him, the people of Louisiana. Frantically, in the days after the Bloody Monday riot had brought impeachment charges to the table, Huey began printing circular messages and newsletters to be distributed to his supporters. Huey knew that the key way to win a political battle is to define the terms of the fight. If Huey allowed the focus to be on his character and his autocratic, anti-democratic corruption, it would be over before it began. The reality was that Huey had probably done enough to be impeached under the Louisiana Constitution, which at any rate was vague about what you had to do to get yourself impeached. If the focus was on Huey versus the law, he may well have lost, but impeachment is a very political process. It's the unseating of an executive by a body of legislatures, and if politics doesn't dictate that someone needs to be impeached, the law doesn't matter so much. So Huey decided to make the battle his favourite political fight. Huey and the people versus the big, evil corporations. He slammed his political opponents, the Dynamite Squad, for being bought and paid for by Standard Oil. Pamphlets and circulars were distributed with astonishing speed. In classic propaganda fashion, Huey's autobiography describes how all the farmers, merchants and workers selflessly handed out pamphlets to support their hero, and that ever since then, the newspapers have been rendered powerless in the politics of Louisiana. In reality, it wasn't all kind-hearted people who loved Huey handing these things out in their free time. They were handed out by his army of state employees, policemen, and some supporters. The money, incidentally, to print these was funded by his shady business associate, Robert Maestri. You know, the guy who sold beds for brothels and donated to the long campaign. In the pamphlets, he struck an anti-standard oil line. I would rather go down to a thousand impeachments than admit that I am the governor of the state, that does not dare to call the Standard Oil Company to account, so that we can educate our children and care for the destitute, sick and afflicted. Huey called mass rallies, warning his supporters to beware the lying newspapers, pay no attention to what they say. At the rallies, he quoted his favourite poem, Invictus, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. But for all this defiance, he can't have felt really like that was true. Pro-impeachment parades took place at the same time, and fights broke out between the protesters that very nearly devolved into riots. Tensions were high in the polarised state. Everyone was forced to pick a side. Even some of Huey's closest supporters, like his childhood friend Harley Bozeman, begged for him to resign. Huey was furious at the perceived disloyalty, or maybe lack of faith, and their friendship never recovered. As Huey tried to frame the debate, the Dynamite Squad put their charges to the House of Representatives. So in order to impeach, they just needed straight majorities from the House and from the Senate. Now you'll remember that they threw a vast array of charges at Huey, some serious allegations of corruption and violating the Constitution, and some general character smears of frivolous nature that he was cavorting with prostitutes and plotting assassinations. In the manner of Louisiana politics, there was an absurd sense of theatre to the proceedings, one moment, a doddery old prolonged delegate would be comparing him to Jesus and then fainting dramatically on the floor. The next, a hula dancer hired by the opposition would be describing him as very frisky. It later turned out that the hula dancer had been offered a job for swearing this story to be true. As far as the serious charges went, bribery was first up on the docket. But this was difficult to prove. Aside from some reports of Huey bragging about buying legislatures and the fact that the, his supporters mysteriously seemed to be appointed to key positions in government, it all looked suspicious, it all smelled bad, but it was very difficult to prove individual cases of bribery. 
The issue for the Dynamite Squad with trying to pin Huey down for this charge was, firstly, pretty much every other governor had also doled out jobs to their supporters, and amongst the Dynamite Squad, there were plenty of people who had done that themselves. An investigation into bribery might be bad for them too, if you catch my drift. Certainly no one wanted to take bribery allegations too far, because everyone was doing it. A more damning and perhaps safer charge was that Huey had mishandled state funds. Here's an example. $6,000 had been requested by Huey to entertain some senators. His pretty young secretary, Alice Lee Grosjean, had withdrawn the entire amount in $20 bills. The previous year, Huey's request for funding to buy a new car had been denied by the Conservatives in the legislature. The day after Alice withdrew the six grand, Huey bought himself a new Buick, paid for entirely in $20 bills. The man in charge of Huey's personal finances, Seymour Weiss, was called to the stand on April 4th. But by April 6th, they'd still got nothing out of him, except the same old story about how the money was spent on the senators. Eventually, after all the theatrics and drama of the impeachment trial, the House dropped some of the more ridiculous and unsubstantiated charges. For example, Huey's alleged ordering of an assassination attempt on his enemy Sanders, which wasn't very credible. But they passed by a majority vote 8 out of 19 charges. These included his attempting to intimidate and blackmail the newspaper owner, Charles Manship, by exposing his brother's mental illness that we talked about last episode. They also included misappropriating the state funds to buy a car, amongst other things, and attempted bribery. There was also a catch-all charge that accused Huey of, quote, incompetency and temperamental unfitness, end quote, that the House passed. No comment. All of the prolonged attempts to stall the charges and slow the progress of the House were ultimately foiled. But Huey was still determined to fight this tooth and nail, literally. While they were debating the last charge, a representative of the Dynamite Squad rushed into the chamber, blood pouring from his cheek. Huey's brother, Earl, had bitten him in a fight. Huey's sanguine response when informed of the fight? I bet he bit him, didn't he? Earl always bites. This strategy of biting your opponents didn't save Huey in the House, or in his words, the so-called House of Representatives, and in the eyes of the state turned to the Senate, where Huey's final fate would be decided. A two-thirds majority would be needed to impeach Huey. If nothing else, the career of Huey Long shows you that people in Louisiana loved a good political drama. Everyone, from the politicians, to the lying newspapers, to political spectators, they were all eagerly awaiting the next round of testimony and voting. Except it never happened. Two days after the Senate convened, one of Huey's senators announced that he had something to show to the court. It was a petition from some of the senators. In it, they explained that, since the legislature was technically supposed to adjourn on April the 6th, any charge filed after that date was illegal and invalid. Therefore, the senators regretfully announced, all of the charges from the House were illegal and should be dropped. Huey could not be impeached, at least not today, and they should all just go home. Incredulously, one of the senators asked, you would vote to acquit him regardless of the evidence? All of the senators who had signed the declaration said they stood by it. There were 15 senators who'd signed the declaration, one more than was needed to block the two-thirds impeachment majority. There was nothing the dynamite squad could do. Regardless of the evidence presented before them, these men were with Huey. This round-robin letter has become an infamous coup in Louisiana legal history, and it really is incredible to think that Huey basically got off on the flimsiest possible technicality. But then you have to remember, the issue had never been about the law. The issue had never been about whether the charges were true, or whether they were legal grounds for impeachment. Realistically, this hadn't been the issue in the House either. But this was all about personal enmities and loyalties, rather than the rule of law. And in the end, the crucial issue was how many senators got bought by Huey, and how many got bought by Standard Oil. While the Dynamite Squad were preparing their charges, and everyone's eyes were fixated on this dramatic public testimony in the House, the theatre of it, Prolong and Standard Oil men were scurrying around Louisiana, offering briefcases full of cash to anyone with a vote. Huey's autobiography gives a stunningly biased account of what went on, with allegations that Standard Oil were offering $250,000 to each senator, and that it was only the loyalty of his close friends and associates who refused financial payments that saved him from disgrace. I have to admit, on a personal note, 
I really loved reading Huey's account. He did have a sense for the big, exciting, dramatic Hollywood moments of heroism. There's this one story where he's saying at one point, a prolonged senator gets offered the position of governor in exchange for flipping his vote. It's ridiculous, that never happened. And Huey and his friends are waiting anxiously by the telephone for news. Then they hear, he's turned him down, and everybody cheers. Huey, heart warmed, concludes, the intense hate of my enemies is more than offset by the loyalty of my friends. Now, even though I know that Huey's amazingly unreliable, that the man in question probably took a bribe, the story is so well written, it feels like a triumph for morals and decency in the face of wicked corruption and corporations. That's how good Huey was at selling himself and painting himself as a hero. He justifies the somewhat sketchy nature of the round robin, the undemocratic nature of it, by painting his opponents as bought and paid for, so crooked that they'd impeach regardless of the evidence. As so often, when you tell Huey that he's corrupt, he throws up his hands and says, Look at the other guys! What choice did I have? Obviously, the nature of this kind of shady backroom deal means that our actual records are sketchy, but the whole round robin episode just smacks of a coup. And we do have quite a lot of accounts about what went on. Until the impeachment, I had no idea how low humanity could sink, said one senator. And there's one particularly golden example of humanity sinking way, way down, concerning one senator called Anderson. It all started when Anderson, who had been pro-Long, put out a statement in a newspaper saying that he wasn't necessarily committed to Long. This is basically him waving a big flag that says, if someone wants to bribe me, my door is open. When Huey quizzed him about it, he evasively said that he had to go to another town for a meeting. Suspicious, Huey followed him and demanded to know what was going on. Anderson admitted that he'd been negotiating with Long's enemies, but he basically said, Huey, I can explain. I was trying to entrap these guys. You know, so it has to look like realistic blackmail. Once they gave me the money, I was going to turn it all the way over to you. Clearly, Senator Anderson was trying to play both sides, maybe hoping to spark a bidding war for his loyalty. But Huey was more cunning than that. Anderson, as you might expect, was no saint. He liked drinking, and he liked women, and it was a combination of both that led Huey's men to discover him in bed with a prostitute and I'm sure they were shocked, just shocked. A combination of blackmail and a decent bribe meant that Anderson signed the round robin. Even the nature of the coup shows that Huey was not naive about how this impeachment was going to be fought. He had outfoxed his opponents, he'd outbribed them, and getting people to sign this letter prevented them from changing their vote later if they found someone who valued their loyalty more. Huey recognised the weakness in the system. Undoubtedly, he got away with crimes as a result but it wasn't like previous leaders hadn't engaged in similar shenanigans. As ever with Huey, the main difference was just how flagrant he was with it. Huey valued the loyalty of his friends immensely, as was demonstrated by the fact that he immediately went on holiday with the Round Robin ears to celebrate. Every single one of the Round Robin signers was rewarded in some way. Many of them got jobs, lucrative contracts, at least one probably took his payment in cash. It's not corruption, it's just rewarding loyalty, right? At the same time, though, Huey knew that the adjournment didn't prevent the impeachers from trying again, and his attacks on them were as vicious as any in Louisiana history. He tried to get them recalled in special elections, fired their relatives from jobs, made threats and carried out reprisals against those who had been against him. Having faced near-political extinction, his paranoia and determination to destroy his enemies only grew. He went everywhere with bodyguards, some armed with shotguns and rifles. You can see them in archive footage of Huey, and he was determined to consolidate his power. A purge in the state government meant that even minor officials who were demonstrably anti-Long got removed from office. This was 1929-30. The Great Depression was kicking in. Of course it hit the poor of Louisiana especially hard, and this meant that Huey's lucrative state jobs were more valuable than ever. They could prove the difference between your family eating and destitution. Huey summed up his new attitude after the impeachment. I used to get things done by saying please. Now, I dynamite them out of my path. Maybe using the nickname of his old enemies gave him a degree of ironic pleasure. Huey, though, was facing up to the same kind of issue that the radical populist reformers have had since the Gracchi brothers in the Roman Republican days. The conservative movements that opposed him were so entrenched 
so unwilling to accept any kind of reform, and so unwilling to accept such a brash and bold character as Huey, that Huey in some ways had no choice but to subvert political norms in order to get anything done. And then the cycle just escalates. Huey has to become less and less of a conventional politician. The Conservatives hate him more and more and try to block him and stall him more and more, until eventually the rule of law and democracy is just thrown apart in this incredibly polarised situation. His actions are not inconsistent with having some principles, some ideals, and a desire to help ordinary people. He, at the same time, he was clearly no saint. All portrayals should remember his corruption and heavy-handed tactics, and a lot of them don't. But the ferocity of the impeachment attempt probably only convinced him further that, in order to achieve any real reform, dynamite would be needed. In Huey's mind, the political system was too broken to be useful. So why not go around it? The thing is, as ever, Huey was much smarter than he ever let on. He used dynamite where he could, but he was very aware of real politique, and like many a good autocrat, he had an intimate knowledge of the edges and limitations of his own power. If he didn't, the fact that his rivals had come so close to a successful impeachment would have told him. So he struck a deal with some of his rivals and some of the wealthy businessmen, a sort of truce. The severance tax that had sparked this entire debate was quietly dropped, and, in exchange, the impeachment charges were not seriously pursued, for now. At the same time as making deals and fighting back against specific rivals, Huey wanted to control the media landscape of the state more generally. He did this by launching his own newspaper, the Louisiana Progress. If the lying newspapers weren't on his side, after all. The Progress reported from a prolonged standpoint, but the highlight was certainly its cartoons. In one of them, Huey's enemies, including Sanders and Senator Rancel, bring a lengthy legal document before Huey, while he's there, nobly handing out school books in a crowd of adoring children, all of whom express their horror and dismay that anyone would want to stop their hero, Huey. The cartoons feature a spidery handwriting that fills up almost the entire panel sometimes, and while they're clearly biased and oozing propaganda, they're charming in their own way. As well as a venue for his soft propaganda, the progress provided Huey with a mouthpiece to attack his opponents, and the other newspapers came in for particular criticism. The only reason you read them is to see what they're saying about me, Huey opined about the press in one editorial. Another, less cheeky and more vicious one, described them as double-crossing polecats, guzzling like bleary-eyed hogs from a trough filled with malice, lies and hypocrisy. Ah, they just don't do bias like they used to. Well, maybe the Daily Mail. Huey's attacks on the media weren't limited to animal metaphors in his editorials, though. In 1930, he proposed a 15% tax on revenue in newspapers, on the advertising revenue, which was rightly seen as an attempt to strangle their business and close many of them down. He also introduced several bills that strengthened libel laws, probably hoping to take newspapers to court with enhanced power. These measures were defeated, and in the case of the 15% tax, it was actually ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, the First Amendment protecting freedom of speech. If Huey had his way, you imagine he would have curtailed free speech considerably. Like many a demagogue who insists that they're beloved by the people, he was still wary of the free press. Alongside railing at enemies, Huey had to contend with the very real problems of the Great Depression and trying to force through his ambitious schemes. There is quite an incredible episode that's almost identical to a scene from It's a Wonderful Life, with a Huey long twist. A bank owner, scared immediately after the Wall Street crash that there'll be a run on the bank. Well, he calls Huey up. I've never been for you, but save this bank and I'll be prolonged for life, he says. Huey shows up at the bank the next day. If you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, you'll remember that the goody two-shoes George Bailey pays all of the customers with his own money. Huey adopted a different tactic. Whenever anyone tried to withdraw her funds, he said, I was here before you. If you insist on taking out your money... I'll take the state's money out first. This bank will fold, and there'll be nothing left to pay you. This gun battle diplomacy worked, and the bank run was prevented. But, in spite of events like this adding to Huey's little book of political rapscallion anecdotes, in other areas his policies were stalling, or even just moving slightly more slowly than he'd hoped. The restlessness of the man was always present. He'd ordered the Capitol building in the state to be torn down and replaced with a new one. 
When the former president, Calvin Coolidge, came to visit him, Huey could barely contain the quips about his ambition. The photograph taken of them, he said, was of once and future presidents. And he joked that if he had found the White House in disrepair, he'd have to have that building torn down and replaced as well. Huey was not willing to be bogged down in the local politics of Louisiana. The state that had held such love for him was just a political springboard. And it's not like he could find much comfort in those local politics anyway. Although his schoolbook program had been passed, and he'd avoid impeachment, Huey had struggled against anti-long legislatures in the House and Senate to get any major appropriation bills passed for his infrastructure programs. Lots of them needed two-thirds majorities, and the anti-long bloc was still large enough to block them. Indeed, the legislative session in 1930 barely passed any legislation at all. This, as much as anything else, explains Huey's next move, a move that sums up his career. Radical, unexpected, throwing everyone else off balance, Huey appealed to his popular support to overcome the stuffed shirt legislative elite, and allow him to break the rules and further his own ambition. On July 15th, 1930, only two years into his four-year term as governor, Huey announced that he was running as a candidate for the US Senate. Now we know that this was just another step in his five-year plan, but at the time, Huey was more diplomatic about it. He had to sell this to the people, after all. By electing him to the Senate, his supporters would demonstrate an overwhelming mandate to pass his infrastructure programme. Legislators who didn't bend to the will of the people would be publicly signing their own death warrant, according to Huey. Lined up against Huey in the election was the friend-turned-enemy, fervent anti-Longite, Senator Joseph Ranzel. Huey had probably been thinking about running for the Senate for months, but there was a slight problem. Timing. There was an overlap. Huey's term as governor expired four months after the new Senate term began. Normally this wouldn't be a problem. He could go to the Senate and leave some loyal underling in charge of the governorship, and previous politicians had done this before. The only issue was that the lieutenant governor was Paul Sear, and after their falling out over that murder case, Sear hated Huey's guts. Huey was in a bizarre situation. If he ever left Louisiana, Sear would have all the powers of an acting governor, and would do everything he could with that power to ruin Huey. He was a hostage to his own political enemy with Sear, and it's quite bizarre to imagine this political relationship gone horribly wrong. Huey obviously thought that the consequences of leaving Sear in charge were bad enough that he couldn't risk it, so he announced that he was going to leave his Senate seat vacant until a new governor, hopefully a long loyalist, was elected to replace him. This was clearly a move that benefited Huey far more than it did Louisiana, who would be without a senator for four months. But Huey brushed off these concerns. He joked, I shall have to stay out of the Senate for four months, leaving the place as vacant as it has been for the last 32 years. A normal politician would probably have waited until 1932, when he could run against the other sitting senator. But Huey saw his chance to increase his stranglehold on the politics of the state. And, as biographer T. Harry Williams puts it, he could never wait or hold back. He had to rush on to wider scenes, to greater power, to his destiny. It's also worth noting that his program in Louisiana had started to stall. Maybe the people would get sick of him if he didn't suddenly change things, if he didn't get a mandate to pass his program. But the more important thing for Huey was personal ambition. As senator, the nightmare of every Louisiana conservative could eventually feasibly come to pass. President Long. If Huey often seems to be well matched against his political opponents, we have to remember two things. One is that he was usually smart enough to choose those opponents, and the other is that we have the benefit of hindsight. Joseph Rancel, his opponent, was 72 and deeply conservative, and he'd been senator for decades without really achieving anything of note. With his long service, sterling reputation, and vast war chests of political funds behind him, you would struggle to find a better incumbent and a more perfect symbol of the establishment, and the type of tired politics that Huey was railing against and broke so sharply with. Yet decades of Louisiana tradition meant that it was very rare for an incumbent senator to be denied re-election. But this was now 1930, and the Great Depression was beginning to bite. Politics as usual, and Ransell's carefully polished gentlemanly charm, would not be enough to satisfy the poor and desperate of Louisiana. Even Ransell's own propaganda was turned against him. 
When a delegation of housewives presented him with a feather duster, symbolising his cleanliness in government, a gleeful Huey began taunting him with the nickname Old Feather Duster. His contempt for Rancel was great enough that he regularly asked the huge crowds at his rallies in these small forgotten towns in the middle of nowhere, Do you even know who your current senator is? All the while, his pet newspaper, the Louisiana Progress, published in far from Mississippi, you'll note, to avoid libel laws, squeezed a few adverts, sports sections, and the Lonely Hearts ads between its wall-to-wall prolonged propaganda. During the campaign, the paper was distributed to voters free of charge. Huey had found a way to get around the lying newspapers, and for the first time, he toured the state in a specially constructed truck that could drive around and amplify his speeches to adoring audiences. As the campaign geared up, as seems to be the inevitable case in the morass of Louisiana politics, the rhetoric and the tactics on both sides got particularly vicious. Surrogates for Rancel, they denounced Huey as an ultra-socialist, who had the face of a clown, the heart of a petty larceny burglar, and the disposition of a tyrant. The conservatives appealed to the basest instincts of Louisiana politics, and the tactics of the old demagogues. They compared Huey to the occupying Unionist generals after the Civil War, and engaged in considerable race-baiting. Once the race card had been played, the conservatives were arguing that Huey's refusal to endorse a judge appointed by Rancel was because he was in league with the NAACP. But once people had started using the race card, Long and his team were hardly above using it. They dug up a friendly letter that Rancel had written to a black politician in New Orleans, and mocked him mercilessly for it. A vote for labour rights and white supremacy is a vote against Rancel, Huey's paper proclaimed. It sounds disgusting to us now, but that was the kind of thing that won you votes back then. Race baiting was unfortunately very par for the course in southern politics of this era. But this was far from the most dramatic and lurid episode of the election. Remember Huey's pretty young secretary, Alice Lee Grosjean? She was always very close to Huey, and her family members were seen as potentially privy to some very interesting gossip. When one of them, Sam Irby, approached the Ransell team, offering to uncover a vast corruption scandal involving Huey and the Highways Commission, naturally the old senator was interested to hear what he had to say but he wouldn't get the chance. A week before the election, members of Huey's private police force, allegedly including Huey's own cousin, burst into the room that Irby was sharing with Alice Lee's ex-husband. Apparently they'd been discussing how best to expose their affair to the media. Both men were arrested. The scene in the room with Huey's advisers after this kidnapping would have been a good fly on the wall moment. It seems like it was maybe closer to the thick of it than the House of Cards. Earl, Huey's brother, was allegedly in favour of having them killed, but Huey shouted him down, finally finding his moral compass, or maybe just realising that getting away with actual political murder is kind of tricky. The bizarre compromise they came up with? The two men were shipped off to an island in the middle of the river, Grand Isle, while Huey figured out what to do next. Unfortunately for the long camp, the disappearance of two notable public figures didn't exactly go unnoticed and wild rumours began to fly around in the anti-long press. A lot of people likely thought that the hapless men were sleeping with the fishes, shot and dumped in a river, or being held in a state prison. Huey realised that he might have to address the little matter of kidnapping and imprisoning witnesses before the election. In classic Louisiana fashion, political enemies suddenly appeared in public with their positions completely and mysteriously reversed. Irby, with either a gun or a checkbook being brandished in his face, appeared on the radio to bizarrely explain the situation the night before the election. He'd been on a, um, fishing trip. Yes, that's the ticket. All the charges against the good governor should of course be dropped immediately. Now there's obviously an element of the hilariously absurd in this story. The idea of Huey and his cronies kidnapping these men, then frantically deciding what to do with the drunk men that they'd kidnapped but Huey never forgot his enmity for Irby. Irby mysteriously lost every state job he ever had. He was confined to an insane asylum at one point, and his wife suspiciously left him immediately after accepting a cushy job with Huey. You have to question the viciousness of a man who used his powers of patronage not just to maintain power, but to crush and humiliate his enemies. By the time Irby published his lurid book, Kidnapped by the Kingfish, explaining his side of the story, He was already a laughing stock. 
It looked like the desperate last move of a broken man. Meanwhile, of course, there was another tense election night to go for the Long Camp. Now you'll remember from the governor's election that the anti-Long base was essentially in New Orleans, while Huey could rely on support from his base in the countryside. The small towns that he toured in his campaigning frenzy, whipping up a storm in his sound truck, these were overwhelmingly pro-Long. As in lots of Louisiana elections, there were some irregularities. It was very kind of the 2,400 voters in St. Bernard to vote for Huey nearly 4,000 times. It was also notable that Charlie Chaplin voted for Huey there, at least according to the records. Maybe he was just taking some time out from his busy Hollywood schedule to get involved in local Louisiana politics. It all smells a little bit like that one election episode of Blackadder. Huey, for his part, when he was asked about some of the curious results from St. Bernard, said that ah, a lot of people there live on houseboats and the census takers can't have found them all. Which um, seems reasonable enough. I mean, I'm sure Babe Ruth did have a houseboat in St. Bernard, Louisiana. In reality, though, Huey had enough support in the countryside that this um, overzealous vote counting was probably overkill. But it all came down to New Orleans. When the results came in, the Ransell camp knew they were sunk. Ransell did win New Orleans, but only by 4,000 votes. It was nowhere near enough, and Huey took the state by 150,000 to 110,000. Somewhere, in a little notebook, he could put a tick next to the box that said, Become US Senator. And there was only one box left to tick. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now!, if you've enjoyed this episode, please rate us or review us on iTunes, Stitcher, your favourite podcast network. Tell your friends about us. You can contact us via Facebook, Twitter, and even donate to the show via PayPal if you think you were doing a good job. And of course, the more people you tell, the fewer posters I have to death-defyingly stick up on motorway bridges. Next episode, we'll see what the Senate makes of Huey Long, and what he makes of them. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zinadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A.bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. <laughs>